Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another CAGP and Donor Motivation Campfire Chat. Uh, I see a lot of people that I know on the chat going back and forth. And uh, for those of you who don't, uh, I don't know, uh, my name is Ryan Fraser. I'm the Donor Motivation uh, Consultant here in lovely London, Ontario. And I am going to be joined here today by my wonderful, talented, amazing friend, Jenny Mitchell, um, here for our campfire chat today. Welcome, Jenny. Hello, Ryan. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, I am not hearing Jenny, so I'm wondering Great. if we have an That's audio it. problem. Ah! We go. Can anyone can else now? in the chat just let me know if they can hear Jenny? Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, bear with me for two <laughs> seconds. I've got a slight technical error on my end. Oh, while oh, you're, I think did you fix it? This is was working for me a few minutes ago, so just bear with me for so, half a second here. So Ryan, I'm going to attempt I, to fix something at my end, or this is going to be a very interesting event today. Well, Ryan, if you if you go ahead, and I'm going to take the stage. Because uh, Gord's saying he can hear both of us, so I'm just gonna gonna keep talking. This could be fun. Wow, this is like doing a duet without being able to hear the other side of it. Um, I am gonna pop back out and pop back on to see if that okay. fixes my audio. I'll be right back, Jenny. As I'm sure you're Take gonna tell me, we are both trained musicians. You know how to improvise. Go, <laughs> my friend. I'll be right back. So um, I have to tell you guys a story about uh, how Ryan and I met. Um, we were introduced through a mutual friend. Many of you might know Leah Eustace. And Leah said to me, you know, you need to meet my friend Ryan. He's, he's also a musician. And um, we, I remember we had breakfast at a small little diner here in Ottawa when he was in town. And uh, we sat down and it was like, we spoke the same language. We had had so many of the same experiences, the learnings that we'd had and the way we were applying them at work. Um, we're so intertwined and so um, we, it was like we'd lived shared stories. And so we got along like a house on fire. Um, we've gotten to know each other over the years. And it's really my pleasure to be talking and bringing to you these thoughts about where we learn from outside the sector. Um, so that's really kind of the theme of our stories here today. Ryan, how you doing? He's connecting to audio. Yes, no? Yes. He's, I think he's busy work. How is it? I can hear you again. Oh, great. How's our campfire chat been going? <laughs> so, uh, but, but first I want you to try my annual appeal. I have this great drink that I think you should try. It's it's Vuli's annual appeal. I, I know you're going to really like it, Ryan. You know what? I've had a lot of people uh, offering me drinks lately, and, and I've actually brought one of my own. So I, I think for the moment I'm going to pass, but I have this wonderful drink uh, that was also on Vuli's mocktail page, and it's called the um, Badly Done Performance Review. Uh, oh. But I'm not, I'm not actually quite finished making it yet. Uh, it turns out one of the requirements was hibiscus leaves, and I had trouble finding them. So I actually found a tea this morning that's a calming tea by Yogi that has hibiscus leaves. So I think before I actually get around to my Badly Done Performance Review, um, I'm going to need to put the tea bag in and, and let it steep. And then the other thing it calls for is a hot pepper on top. And I think we'll need time for that to kick in. So if it's okay with you, I think we'll get to that a little bit later this morning. Is but that okay? Yeah, okay. But like, like, I'm really liking that, that, yeah. But, you know, I, I do want to talk to you about the annual appeal. I just want to be clear, right? Okay. Not that I'm bothering you or filling your inbox or your, your snail mail with, with letters, but I, I do want to get to that annual appeal, right? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, how about we get to both our drinks a little bit uh, later on this morning? Morning. Sounds wonderful. Sounds <laughs> wonderful. So I told the story of how we met, just so you know, so you're not out of the oh, loop, yes. uh, about how we had had these shared experiences through music and how um, they had informed our journey into philanthropy, into fundraising, the good and the bad, I would say, of classical music. I, I certainly don't want to sit here and suggest to everyone that it was all rosy or that it was all, um, what is it, butterflies and dandelions and unicorns? Yeah. No, it wasn't that at all. Um, but there were some real learnings that we came from. And I, I love this idea that you've proposed of talking about where we learn outside our sector. So where do you learn, Ryan? Oh, my goodness. You know, everywhere. Um, as many of you know on the call, I have often joked that I was too for-profit for non-profits, too non-profits for for-profits, and too academic for everybody. Uh, and I've always had a foot in, in all three worlds, as I know you have, which is why we connected uh, so instantly when Leah introduced us. 
And, you know, it's, it's remarkable because CAGP was the first home that I, I felt that I had that was filled with freaks like me. Sorry, everyone. Um, but, you know, it's, it's amazing because one of my, one of my favorite clients uh, got her PhD in, um, in Europe. And I don't know if this was your experience with, with your doctorate. So I don't know if Jenny's mentioned this, but you know, Jenny has a doctorate in piano performance. And I was halfway through a PhD in uh, music psychology, looking at how we learn to read music versus text. And then I decided I probably would have murdered someone if I stayed in academia and I switched and do the kind of work that I, I do now. And, um, but the, the research, the academic side of me has always been fascinated by all these things in the world. And you know, my client, uh, her name is Alex. And she said to me, Ryan, she goes, your challenge is you're a synthesist. She goes, most North American uh, PhDs are specialists and get really, really narrow and just know their field. But you've always been really excited by the big picture and everything that's out there. And she goes, and that's how we do PhDs in, in Europe, which I always found really, really fascinating. And so I find like, I have spent so much time um, looking around in different fields to trying to figure out where we can get best practices from, from other mm -hmm. fields. And as you and I have that music background, mm -hmm. you know, we have mm -hmm. talked over the years about those performance skill sets, the way you interact with people, the practice, mm -hmm. the practice, the practice mm -hmm. that you and I know have spent hours in. But I also love looking at all kinds of research that's coming out. And in our field, we see Russell James, but I'm also fascinated in the tech fields, mm -hmm. uh, what's coming out in consumer research and things like that. So how about you? Where are you finding that inspiration these days? Oh, so, um, you know, right now, so I do a lot of books, like I'm a book lover and I got to send a shout out to Eli Clark, who put me on to a really cool book called Peak. P-E-A-K, which is how ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Another and trained it, musician. By another, me. I know, another trained musician. Yeah, and um, the book is all about how deliberate practice is used in sports, is used in um, classical music, of course. In other words, rather than practicing, okay, here's the best analogy. You don't get better playing chess. You get better studying the moves and the management of other chess players games and so Eli in particular is really interested in how to transition that deliberative practice from a classical environment to in his case a plan giving donor conversation environment um, and that kind of stuff gets me really fascinated the second thing I'd like to highlight which I cannot um, encourage people enough I have been started this journey on executive coaching starting in September of this year and I am loving the learning I'm getting through the coaching process. For those of you major gifts officers out there, you will recognize so much of the executive coaching work around open-ended questions, around pondering things, around um, you know, the drop and listen. Um, we are not in charge as coaches, right? It's the donor, or in my case, the coachee that's, that's in the seat. Um, and we are their partners in the journey. Um, so just a shout out to all those major gifts people. Cannot um, encourage enough people to explore coaching or books about open-ended questions or dialogue. Final fun nerdy th fact, Ryan. Did you know that by asking a question, your neurology of your brain changes and you activate, wait for it, reticular activation system which is exactly what you said, that synthesis piece, it, it, it touches all these different neurons and it actually uses more of your brain and it forces you to formulate options and potential. And that's what our brain is so good at, right? Is finding solutions to things. So there you go. There, there you go, right? It's, it's summed up. And the thing is we often see in, in the fundraising industry and for those of us who, who work as, as in the advisor industry, that questions are a bad thing. And what you've just outlined is that questions are a great thing and if we're not the sort of people who are used to thinking about questions or asking questions or being comfortable with our donors asking questions, mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we all recognize the importance that that plays in them mm -hmm. for, for decision making. Now, we've just come through an extraordinary year. Mm -hmm. um, what have mm -hmm. you seen in terms of the real leaders in the sector? Because I know you're working with a lot of people across the sector, across the country. Where are you seeing the people in the organizations that are really stepping up? What are the common behaviors and patterns and how they're approaching leadership and personal development? And what, what do you see as those patterns? Mm -hmm. So I wrote a ra relatively dark piece called The Culling of Our Sector uh, for Hillborn. Um, I'm sure we could find that link too. And it basically said, here we are living Darwinism. And what I meant by that, Ryan, was the organizations that were thriving before 
um, are still thriving and the organizations that were struggling before are still struggling. So here's what I see. I see brave leadership, people stepping up and saying, I don't know how to do this. What is this Zoom thing? Uh, how can we connect with our donors? I see brave leaders pivoting. I see brave leaders saying, being vulnerable and saying, I don't know how this is gonna go, but we're gonna try it. Um, and I also see fearful leaders uh, doubling down, not sending the appeal letter, not asking, um, you know, basically hunkering down and, and holding on to those reserves and watching it tick, 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 tick away. And the other thing I would say is that the organizations that had a strong community support before the pandemic, it merely flew into the pandemic with that support under their sails. And the folks that were struggling to find their mission, struggling to find their niche or their community, those people really, uh, that those communities didn't exist before and they've, they've found no new way of connecting. So to me, it's a little bit about relevance. I said in the article that um, I figured we'd see a big slash of the number of charities, maybe not next year. I don't know, this will be fun, uh, maybe 2022. And I'd be interested to see on the chat what folks are seeing or what their predictions are, because we've gone through 2020, Ryan. We're in the middle of 2021. And what I'm hearing now from the sector is, what the bleep does 2022 hold? And that's kind of where the, the leaders that I'm talking to are thinking about. You know, I, it, it's interesting as you say that, the first thought that comes to mind, um, one of our donor motivation clients here here in London, uh, Jesse's Journey, I'm not sure if, if Perry's on the call or not today, the, the executive director CEO there, uh, was telling me about an amazing uh, insight that they've had. Mm -hmm. So if you're not familiar with Jesse's Journey, they're, they're very well known in this area. Uh, John Davidson took his son Jesse on a wheelchair walk across Canada uh, and then he went and did it again uh, later and uh, Jesse suffered from Duchenne muscular dystrophy and it, wow. it, was, it, it was a very big thing in our, our part of the world uh, when that happened 20, 30 years ago and so the organization exists to uh, do genetic research into Duchenne and, and similar diseases. Um, but of course, most of the people involved with Perry's organization have a child, usually a male child, because it's a genetic disease that tends to run down the male lineage, um, who's very limited in mobility. And so Jesse's journey has had to totally pivot and change to online virtual events. And the feedback that Perry told me that he was getting is that it's actually opened up all kinds of doors and opportunities yeah. for them, not just not just on the services front, but the donation front, because everyone is suddenly moving to the format that we are today. And it turned out for their families, it is so much easier yeah. to work yeah. in a virtual world than it was in an in-person world. So I think we're gonna see a lot of organizations yeah. And, and I, to me, this goes back to our music training, right? Remember mm -hmm. those times when we were training and we got given a piece that was one or two levels ahead of what we were capable of, right? That, and, that and was always Ryan. That was always <laughs> the piece, right? And and I know Don Sinta, who I studied with, he loved to put something in front that would just yeah. push you to your absolute limits. Yeah. And the thing is, you didn't know what you could do until you were forced to, you know, yeah. to swim to get back above water. Yeah. And it's painful and it's horrible feeling. But when you come out, you suddenly realize you've grown exponentially. And right. I think to me, that's like the biggest lesson of the last year. And, and I've seen that with organizations like Ferries. We've certainly seen within the donor motivation program. Um, and I know many of my fundraising friends, same thing. We have to think in a different way and it's been forced. We've been yeah. smacked over the head. It's the little rabbit fooper. Remember that one as a kid where you get smacked the bunny on the head. I don't want to see you pooping up the field, no. mice and popping them on the head. There you go. I wasn't a singer, so I won't do the duet. Yeah, yeah. Definitely a saxophone player. So so I love that analogy of, of adaptation and whatnot. I think that's a, a fantastic one. And um, I would agree with you. Like anybody who's working with donors, they they pick up the phone, Ryan. They want to talk to you. Um, some people, I mean, the creativity I've seen, people going on the wards, hospital wards, with phones and on uh, FaceTimes with donors, just showing them around, connecting people, finding new ways to connect people to real things. Uh, the craving I'm, I'm getting from donors to, to have something meaningful in their groundhog days um, and the gratitude that I have seen. I mean, I'm at a tennis club um, where, you know, most of the time we're, most of us are relatively grumpy. Well, some people are grumpy about their memberships. People are so happy to play tennis and they tell us at the front desk how awesome we are. It's like, it's, it's like, wow, we didn't notice how lucky we were to have what we had. And I see Claire's got a reference here of the 
1920s, right? I'm, I'm looking forward. So Claire, my prediction is let's have the roaring 20s back. So once we get through this, let's have like the party of the century. Let's have a fantastic time and let's celebrate for the next, I would say 10 years. I mean, I realize the pandemic is going to kind of go like this. Um, but yeah, I see somebody saying in the chat, broadening of this, of the, of our thoughts. That's really what I think we hope to bring to this, wasn't it, Brian? Something yeah. a little bit broader. Let's, let's spin it back to the music background again, because I, I feel in the conversations that you and I have had, certainly over the last year, but even for the three or four years before that, were about all the ways that you and I found that the things that we learned to do as mm. musicians translated really well. So let's, yeah. let's talk about deliberate practice for a moment, because I think we're yeah. given this opportunity right now where, mm -hmm. you know, we, we all had to run so fast up until the last year, then kind of everything went to dead stop. I think there's a chance now for all of us to think about what we're doing and practicing. So tell me as someone who, who completed your doctorate, because you're Dr. Jenny and I'm either Fa Ryan or Do Ryan, because I was only got halfway through the PhD before I decided it wasn't for me. Um, tell me from your perspective, like, Mm -hmm. What are those things, those yeah. habits that you picked up as a highly, highly, highly trained, skilled musician that are helping you today mm -hmm. in fundraising? Okay, so the first thing I would say is, um, and I'm watching it with my kids. So you go into music for the curiosity, right? You don't go into music for the money or whatever. You go in because there's like some kind of a thing that really intrigues you and that you can't really get enough of and you want to understand it more. And I relate to my kids because I'm really trying to encourage them to explore things and they have interests that are completely irrelevant to mine. Um, but I always try to encourage them to, to dive for the pursuit of learning. And so I think that's actually something that I got through music, Ryan, was this love of like the curiosity of, I wonder what happens if I do it this way, or if I change the fingering, if I do that. And it's very self-directed music. Like, I mean, we have a very strong hierarchy behind music, which we could talk about. We'd need another two hours. Um, but that pursuit of something just to know the answer or to find out. And I think of that when I think of the first annual appeal I wrote, right? Green, green, Jenny. And wanted to read every article I could find on it, find out what the best practice was, you know, yeah, continuous growth for the sake of growth, says Eli, absolutely, like, trying to just tackle the thing to the ground, to be honest, which is very much a musician thing, so we have a discipline to us, we have a due diligence to a fault, I would say, you know, to, to our mental health detriment, maybe, if I was going to yeah. add some things, the perfectionist. I, I'm going to jump in for a second, Go ahead. I'm share something I've never shared with you, I interviewed someone once uh, for a financial advisor role in my management days, and he was like us, a, a trained musician. And he said to me, he goes, I was trained to be uh, obsessive compulsive by my music training, and I'm not sure that was a healthy thing. And he was actually debating the impact that it had on his life. So just to give you an idea, if you Absolutely. haven't had that level of training, you know, we, we were trained down to minute details that the average person could not hear but that's what was necessary to operate at that high level. So there is a personal self-care part of this that I think yeah. is really important that I've learned over the years to, to know, like go into it so far and no more because it's easy if you have that personality of that continuous growth to dig too deep. And then sometimes you get to an unhealthy place or one that's the return on investment is, is no longer so good. Sorry to interrupt. But I wanted no, to- No, that, that's with, actually with really- comment you made. Yeah, very important. And I would almost say like, um, sometimes that feels a little bit like Alice in Wonderland and that you get so far down in something because you're actually avoiding something else, mm. right? So just a little coachy moment there for us all. Um, but a really great reminders. And I, I'm still processing, like if I was completely honest, Ryan, I'm still processing that whole piece of my life, you know? Not that I put a box on it and turned the key. I'm still trying to unpack it all. Um, but you know, if I was think of if you're on this call and you're not a musician, what can what can you notice or learn from this conversation? You know, musicians are trained to assimilate things really fast, right? Like how's this go? What's the what's the patterns? And then make extrapolations really fast. And the parts that are hard in a piece, we practice extra hard. So I can remember, um, you know, the piano books are really big and heavy, like Beethoven piano sonatas are like, whoa, like this. Yeah. So I would photocopy um, the part that I was working on because I'd have a backpack and I'd be going from shop to shop. And then there would be the really hard passage, you know, the octave passage or the double thirds or something that I, I just had to practice like five, 10, 15 times more. And I would actually start my practicing with that. 
Now, how does that relate to major gifts or being in leadership? It means do the hard things first and know that practice will improve it. Um, so then going back to a teacher environment where you say, well, I tried this and I tried that. For our leaders on the calls, that might be a peer group or a community group that says, I tried these double thirds this way, or I tried to invite investment this way, and this is what happened. And then most important, reflection. What can we do differently? What can we, how can we shift our thoughts around this to make it more palatable? So there's a couple of great learnings for folks on the call. I think. Yeah, you know, I, I think back to Don Sinta, who I studied with, and Don was one of the great gods of the saxophone world. So it was it was an honor just to get in to study with him as yeah. a graduate student. He took no more than one or two graduate students a year, and everyone in the world was was trying to get in there. And I couldn't believe that I got in with him because I heard the people who were, you know, trying to get in there, and they were leagues better than I was. Um, but we really clicked because I think he and I shared this passion for education and looking outside of our own narrow scope. And he said, yeah. that's the thing he looked for in a student. And he said, his job as a mentor was to stuff my brain with enough information that was on a zip file that would slowly decompress in my head for the rest of my life. And here I am 26 years or so after doing my master's with him. And here we are having a conversation, thinking back to those days. And as you've said that, I think about all the things that Don relayed, not just, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, you know, learning mm -hmm. to do difficult music is like learning to tackle life, right? And sure. we, I have both talked about seeing students that would try to rehearse a piece by starting the beginning and going to the end. Yeah. It's the worst way to do it. Doing what you did, bringing it out in chunks. By the way, I used to say to my students, uh, blowing chunks because we were saxophone players. So that's how they all, they all remember it. And the best thing is I found out 10 years ago, a couple of them met each other at random at a concert and they both wrote blow chunks and they both looked at each other and said, did you study saxophone with Ryan? And they totally met in the middle of nowhere. Um, so you never know what your legacy is going to actually be. Um, <laughs> but the amazing thing about thinking about where you need to work and focusing on it is inevitably all the other things get better because you realize things about what you're doing Mm -hmm. that apply to just that little bit and you go well wait a minute I'm doing that over here as well mm -hmm. and it's not as noticeable because mm -hmm. maybe that's not a critical function mm -hmm. like the concept of piano you're talking about your octaves well it may be that you discover in the process that your hand movement right right, right. is not smooth right. it's jerky but then you realize well then transferring that to something you're doing on your other hand hey the same thing's happening and I can get away with it because I don't have that same pattern and I think when we're working with donors yeah. when we're talking with people when we're thinking about planning for those of us who are in the planning side of more complex planned gifts knowing that you have an area to improve and really hyper focusing on it yes. will allow you to go back and think about other things that you've worked on before and have a lot of really huge aha moments and you know it, growth is really funny because I uh -huh. find it's minimal, 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 yeah. boom, huge jump, minimal, 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 but you couldn't do the huge jump without all the little minimal stuff because you're going back and you're, you're retraining your brain, you're retraining your mm -hmm. skill set to do things that you've had to learn. So you have to unlearn them, to relearn yeah. them, to do them better. And when you see the great people in our field out mm -hmm. there, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just amazing because they make mm -hmm. that a way of life and they tend to be I found in the music world, the most humble people as well. Yeah. You know, you hear the diva story. The divas often were not talented. The truly amazing, talented people would make your jaw drop were so humble because they had that imposter syndrome that they didn't mm. think well. And I know there are so many people on our call, yes. in our CGP family, in our wider fundraising family who go, geez, I, I wonder if I should be here and do this. But those are the people who I respect the most because they're doing incredible things and they're just not seeing how incredible they are. And that's a testament to those are the people that always yeah. take it, yeah. take it down. So my piano teacher used to tell me that the best month was September because he would have taught them September till May and then his students would go away for the summer. And he would say that. He would say when they came back in September, it was like, whoof because they've had the time to process the learning and assimilate the learning. And that really ties into that conversation. I mean, people say it different way. We talk about growth edges in, in coaching, you know, leading into growth edges, but there's that thing about unconsciously incompetent, I don't know, consciously oh, incompetent. That's one minute manager. Oh, that's no, how can that be? Taken. It's the one minute manager, the unconscious competent, the conscious yeah. disillusioned learner. That's the one where you want to quit. So how many of you are newer into plan yeah. giving and you've reached the stage where you've lost your motivation, you want to quit? That's actually when you're about to make the biggest gain. Yeah. If you ever get a chance, it's uh, Ken Blanford, Ken Blanchard, 
if you ever get a chance to read the book or take the course, that was life altering for me okay. in a management role. Can you repeat those again for people? Because I think that's yep. really important. So your first stage is you're the enthusiastic beginner. You're so happy to be in the job. You're going to walk through walls. You know squat, but you have all the motivation in the world. And then stage two, you become the dissolution learner where you've just realized you know squat, so your motivation has plummeted. And stage three is you become the conscious competent, or sorry, the unconscious competent. Yeah. You actually know your stuff. You just don't realize it, so your motivation is still a little suppressed. But when you hit the conscious competence stage, that's when you're rocking and rolling because you know your stuff, you've got the motivation to do it, and you know that you can learn anything in your field because you can figure out where to go for the resources. Yeah. And the goal is, you know, if you're a leader out there and you're managing your staff, you need to know where they are, but we all have a natural place where we fit as teachers, as coaches, as leaders, yeah. and it may not line up with where that person is. And so you either need to find a manager that can speak at that level, or you need to be really adaptive. And there's, there's all kinds of cool workshops uh, that I've given over the years on that. It's, it's an amazing kind of mental process um, to go through. Yeah. So we are down to our, uh, our last couple of minutes. Any before Ooh. we go and, and before Ooh. I go back to attempt my, um, Badly done performance review. I think it's steep. That's changed colors. It's gone from the look of urine to the look of blood. So I'm not sure what Bully was thinking with this. Um, should it, should I try this, Jenny? Um, but first, I think you should probably test out the annual peel. This is apparently a sickly sweet uh, drink. Very lots of sugar. You know, goes down really smooth. Inspires you to open your wallet. Ryan, do you want to taste? Actually, well, considering that Vuli said that mine is spicy, bitter, sour, and may not go down so easily, um, how about we try them at the same time? Okay. People can judge by our facial expressions which one of us is better off. Here we go. Cheers, my friend, for a great conversation Cheers. at the campfire. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm tasting it. You know, like a lot of performance reviews, now that it's done, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. How about yours? <laughs> Very sweet. I I, um, I suddenly feel the urge to run to my wallet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, there's my alarm going off here in the background to say that we have uh, come home <laughs> at the very end. Um, Jenny, I want to thank you so much for your time today, uh, your insights. Uh, you're one of my great friends and personal mm -hmm. heroes with everything that you do. And I know everywhere you go, everyone says to me, oh, my goodness. She's amazing, and oh, I'm just thrilled to have you as a friend. I'm so thankful for Leah's um, introduction. Yeah. I don't know if you mentioned this group, but Leah's introduction was, oh my goodness, I can't believe you haven't met Jenny. She's like you, but female and smart. Um, <laughs> so I need a bit of clarity to figure that one out. But I've never been so glad to meet someone in my life. And as everyone can tell, uh, we've got along in the door uh, chatting with one another. We could do this for another six hours, but you've got a life to get to. Um, I do want to let you know that our next event, uh, our next campfire chat is going to happen. Campfire chat, there was no alcohol in my drink, right? It was a mocktail. Uh, is going to be April 8th. Uh, Serena is working on a very special, super secret guest that she's just waiting to get confirmation on, uh, but uh, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, Serena is always just a delight to hear her talk, and um, I am looking forward to seeing everyone in April. Um, also at the national conference, I'm just going to throw a really yeah. quick plug out. The CGP yeah. national conference is coming up. Um, I'm on the program committee and the education committee, so I'm super biased to tell you it's the best thing in town in the virtual world. Claire has just thrown the link in. If you haven't registered, go. And talking about leadership, one thing that I've been pressing for for years to get on is one of our plenary speakers, David Posen, Dr. David Posen, is a specialist in stress management. And if there's ever been a year mm -hmm for our allied professionals, for our fundraisers, for everyone to put some practice and thought into our development around how we're handling stress. Mm -hmm. This is the year to do it. Make sure you catch this plenary. I think it's gonna be very timely. And if you look, all kinds of other great things that are gonna be on the conference as well. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Sorry, I won't be in person. Jenny, I'm gonna give you a big remote hug through the screen here and a big hug to the whole CGP family. Thank you.